Hey, welcome back to another episode of Seven Figure Music School. In today's episode, we are covering a topic that both Nate and I have a lot of experience with, and that is summer camp. This is actually going to be the first in a series of episodes that we do about summer camp. So whether you are already running a successful camp or a small camp that you want to grow bigger, or you've always wanted to start one, we're going to share our best thinking, observations, and real life experiences for running a really successful and profitable summer camp. And I will further say that in this episode, we are going to specifically focus on how to promote and potentially even sell out your summer camps, which is something that both Nate and I have a lot of experience with. For me, going all the way back to 2005, for Nate, best we can tell, we were looking through his records before we shot this episode back to 2011. Um, and I think a great way, Nate, to start this episode is just to spend one or two minutes each talking about our camp experience, kind of setting up what we're going to share afterwards about promotion, marketing, how to fill those camps. Let's start with number one, our experience and all the ways you can run camp. So maybe mm. Nate, start by telling me a little bit of your story. One, two minutes, your, your camp story, the kinds of camps you run. And I think that'd be a great way to begin. Yeah, totally. So when we started Brooklyn Music Factory, we had no camp. Right, we were an after-school program that focused on bands and private lessons within the uh, rock and pop world. So that's what we did, and it was really my partner who had grown up in a family where her father has to this day run a summer camp, and that was his. That's the family business. So she wow. grew up literally working in a camp, and she was like, "We one hundred percent need to start offering a summer camp," and so. Our program started with just 65 summer camp students way back in 20, I think, 11 or 12. And at the time, we started like most people do, which is was just kind of like the shotgun approach. We just said, let's just offer everything we do now, but over the summer. Um, and we've since totally refined it. Now we're very much, very specifically a songwriting camp. We have a songwriting bands. We serve ages 4 to 11. We're, we've gotten hyper specific about the age range that we serve, and yeah, we've grown. We grew from sixty-five campers to n this summer. Well, we grew as many as you know. We served as many as five hundred campers this wow. summer, and um, this summer though, we're going to be probably right around three hundred. Yeah, still kind of. All of us are still kind of recovering from that pandemic hiccup that through all, all of our businesses. Yeah, and and uh, yeah it's partly that it's actually by design we we just we shrunk our camp and it's a very profitable and it's and 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 um you know my partner Pierre runs an amazing program and we we know exactly what the return on that investment is and and we know what it takes to sell it out and we do the size of camp that works for us so we're yeah. going to be doing 300 this year and um that's what we do so it's a songwriting camp for kids very specifically so let me take one to two minutes to briefly share my camp experience <laughs> I was just out of college. I had literally graduated the month before. I graduated mm. mid-year 2004 because I was an idiot and decided to do two majors. And, uh, <laughs> and so it extended me to nine semesters. And Christmas break of 2004, my best friend, Greg Jenner, who's been on the podcast twice and will probably be back here in 2023 again multiple times, he called me up over Christmas break and said, Daniel, because he graduated two years before me, and he said, let me just tell you, I'm really happy you're teaching piano, but you're going to learn that summer is the worst time of year for a piano teacher, and mm. I'm going to solve that problem, and I want you to help me. And hmm. over the first six months of 2005, we co-designed and wrote a summer camp curriculum and method to get kids through their first book in one week. That became yeah. the Piano Express Summer Camp, which eventually became a year-round after-school program. But for the first five years, it was only a summer camp curriculum. The first summer we had seven kids because neither one of us knew how to promote that camp. By the fifth summer, we were enrolling around 200 kids a summer into that camp. We rented an external location. That is my only camp experience. Mm. Greg and I also would run these songwriting camps for late beginner to intermediate students. Go dig it. And we would run small camps because both Greg and I loved writing songs, uh, pop mm. songs, uh, lyrics, and, you know, typical pop instrumentation, that sort of thing. It was our dream. And it was the reason we became friends because we would show our songs to each other in the practice rooms at our college. 
and we would critique each other's lyrics and chord progressions, et cetera, et cetera. So we That's took cool. that love and we also turned it into a much more custom camp. It was a little more expensive than our typical beginner mm-hmm. camp. We would enroll kids. And the third experience I had with camp was just running camps, very small camps in my own studio. And I would say that I have experience, obviously, running a camp that was big, that like a, a big commercial studio would run. That's what Greg and I did with Piano Express. But then I just found these ways to make summer the most profitable time for year, even in my own studio. And this is something I started doing after Greg and I kind of officially ended this the Piano Express summer camp curriculum. So I have experience running kind of like specialty camps, um, enrichment camps in my own personal studio as a single teacher, and then kind of big commercial studio camps where we had 24 kids at a time that were going through this curriculum that Greg and I had designed. So between you and me, Nate, we have a combined many years of experience running camps of all type, promoting it. And I think that's really a good way to begin the series on camp, a good way to begin our comments on how to promote a camp now, I think that kind of leads us into what I'll call point number two here. When should you actually begin promoting your camp? Obviously, you, the summer is looming. Uh, right. When do you begin promotion for camp, Nate? So it took us a, it took us a few years to get this rhythm correct. Um, but now we have it down, I think, really to a science where we actually have two sort of seasons of promotion. We have what we call our early bird season. Mm-hmm. where we're um, inviting families to enroll, guaranteeing them the week they want, giving them some sort of, you know, sometimes it's a price break or we'll add on some, there's some sort of benefit for being an early bird. And that will happen, that happens uh, as early as October before the summer. So we start in October and November and December, we run the early bird promotion Depending on how sales are going, we'll extend it through January. Just to just to be specific, we will enroll 300 campers in our in our summer camp. We will expect to sell 50 percent of those slots for sure by the end of January. Our early bird campaign. That's how it begins. Um, and then from February through, I'd say April is when we'll sell the remaining. And then, of course, there's always anybody who has been doing a camp of any kind knows that there's also always those last minute pieces that are moving because summer is different than an after school program that you're normally doing in that way. So we'll talk about that later, but that's our promotion. That's sort of, that's the marketing calendar for us. We make sure that everything's in place in October. We're absolutely selling early bird through January, and then we are finishing selling it out by April. Mm, Okay. I like that. Um, tell you what I personally did. And again, since there were a couple different camps that I ran, um, there were different time frames that I operated. <clears throat> Let me start with the Piano Express. Greg and I would have just finished our August camps. So we would run them June to August every summer. Some summers we did 12 weeks mm, with, nice. with 20 to 24 kids per week. We would have just finished We'd take the month off, and then in October, we'd start planning out for the next summer in October of the previous year. Similar to you, Nate. Yep, totally. Our calendar centered around the deadlines for the opportunities we took to promote. So there was a, in in the Northern Virginia area, there was a very popular, again, this was the mid-2000s, okay? There was a very popular paper and ink publication that a lot of parents read called Washington Parent. We would run ads in there. We would run digital ads on the Washington Parent website because it was a kind of a hub for... And you know what? And I got to be careful because I'm already getting into the how. I want to not do that here. I want to talk more time frame. But we looked at all these deadlines for these different opportunities that we wanted to have, including like a camp fair and things of that nature. And we, we just worked backwards from there. And... So we knew that promotion kind of centered around these these deadlines for taking advantage of these opportunities. So that I would do my investigation. We Greg and I of when those deadlines were, Greg and I would meet, we'd talk about budgeting for it, and then I kind of handled all the marketing for that and making sure those deadlines were met, getting creative and all that to those sorts of things. There was internal promotion. We would do early bird as well in the early part of the year. Mm-hmm. And um and then we would just have a steady stream of emails reminding people to 
to sign up. If you want to have a successful summer camp, sell out a summer camp, I think the best thing you can do is no matter what time of year you begin planning for it, you sit down, you have a calendar, and you actually begin to plan out and visualize all the opportunities you have for promotion. And you reference that calendar each month. And I'm talking even going to the level of putting on when those deadlines are to be in this publication, deadline to apply to be at this camp fair, when you're actually going to send out emails promoting it internally, when you're actually going to send out reminder emails for people who expressed interest by signing onto your email list, when are you going to send out emails to remind them that it's coming up or that the early bird special is ending? Plan all that out now. That probably takes away 80% of the stress and anxiety of filling that camp up. And most people don't take that most people don't take that advice. Most people don't sit down and have even that basic level of organization, but that basic level of organization is really important to filling up or selling out a summer camp. Let's move to point three then, Nate, which is how to promote your camp. I think I'll take point on this one, and then I'd love to get your perspective. I think we're going to come at this one from very different angles, and mm, nice. I couldn't help myself. I started previewing this in the previous a point, but let me just make a laundry list here of opportunities that people should take advantage of and even some specific tactical things that they can do uh, and maybe even some things that are unusual because some of the advice I'm going to give here, I've given to clients over the years and they look a little surprised at some of these pieces of advice. Mm. Uh, and I'll let the audience decide which ones are surprising and which aren't. So first off, I just have to say it. You need to run a Google ads campaign for summer camp, period. However, you should not take, you, you should not think that you're limited only to that campaign for enrolling for your summer camp. One of the things I did in my smaller camps later was anybody who was inquiring about beginning lessons during the springtime, a lot of times I would just say, hey, go ahead and enroll, but you should actually come to our beginner camp at the beginning of June. They will come. Most kids, if they were starting now, wouldn't even finish their first book until Christmas of this year. If you start now and then come to that beginner camp in June, your child will actually be through their first book and well into their second one by the end of June. I got so many parents to enroll who weren't even looking for a summer camp opportunity just because of how I did enrollment that way. And when we were running the Bigger Piano Express camp as well, same thing would happen with Greg. Once we got past the 2010 mark and we actually had the year-round after-school program running, um, once again, in the springtime, if people started in just traditional weekly, you know, lessons, whether group or private, we would take the opportunity to promote the camp to those folks, go ahead and enroll them now to secure the commitment, but then how, but really promote the camp to them because the child would actually get a lot of uh, benefit coming to that beginner camp, even if they already had four to eight weeks of experience getting the skill under their belt. So there's there, there's that that's number two. Number three, print publications. I think we sleep on these things now, but there are a lot of ways. You even mentioned the one just a second ago, like flyers in folders. Totally. Uh, ma magazine, uh, mailers. We ran mailers, little postcards. It wasn't inexpensive, but we ran postcards just to get total saturation in a small geographic area around where we held the camp. So there's those opportunities. There's other digital opportunities that one could take out, could take advantage of, such as making sure you're listed on GMB, just so that you have a marketing funnel in place for that. Craigslist ads, uh, any kind of non-mainstream ways of, of getting exposure. Um, so perhaps collaborating with other businesses and uh, doing a promotion with them where maybe you pay for access to their list. I'm sending an email blast out uh, from a local business that has a, a, a mailing list of local uh, families or, or basically a, a locally based email list. You can even buy locally based email lists from marketing companies where you can do email blasts to folks uh, through their service. Just so many ways to do that. But then I think the crown jewel is if there is a camp fair or some way that you can interact with people one on one. You absolutely have to sign up for that. And we didn't even do it very well, but we would show up to the camp fair and we, the first year, we just marveled at how awesome the booths look for everyone right, around us. Right. And we just had like this 
junk banner and like a CRT so television, um, <laughs> like an old television that we looped a video um, from our first year of camp on that. And then it was just me and Greg tabling and um, with a clipboard, no decorations, no like visual display, just talking to people. And honestly, we did actually get a fair number of signups from that, but we did get a little more sophisticated <laughs> in in subsequent years, but you got to take advantage of things like that. This even goes back to, I think, episode 17, the podcast where uh, Brian, uh, who we I kind of been following his progress, starting a school from scratch in June of 2021. One of the main ways that he grew his school was local fairs, where he just mm. set a booth up, camp fairs, local opportunities like that. So those are some big picture ideas I would give. But I think the one that people sleep on is that they, they think too narrowly. They think, oh, I'm advertising for camp here. Here's my camp funnel. And then I'm advertising for my lessons here. And never shall the twain overlap. Such right. a missed opportunity. We got so many enrollments for our, our summer camp, whether it was the Big Piano Express camp or the personal small camps that I ran in my own private single teacher studio by really just taking advantage of that whole, even late winter, February, March, starting to promote from that. And then the final thing I'd say, number seven, would be uh, internal emails. Younger children who are growing up and aging into your camp range, um, if you're running a camp that isn't a beginner camp, but serves current clients, just making sure that you're promoting that heavily and making the emails fun and educational over the entire first part of the year, uh, that's just opportunity you can't miss. So those are the seven things that I would say are must do promotional strategies for a camp. Nate, I know I probably stepped on a lot of things that you'd say, but I bet you that you have some thoughts. You're, I bet you'll come from a perspective that I'm not coming from given the, the difference in our background. So I'd love to hear what you'd say around this point. Well, you hit on, you hit on the big ones. So, so, which is great. Um, but I want to add just some nuance to mm -hmm. a couple of these channels that you added that you gave there. Um, I just let's let's start let's work backwards on internal emails. So email marketing is the number one way that we sell out mm -hmm. our day camps and our summer camps. And and just to clarify, in our program, um, and I know you're going to talk about what you and Greg built and how it differs here, but. At BMF, one of the one of the early mistakes we made was thinking that everybody who was in our after school program um, surely would want to do summer camp, and vice versa. We spent a lot of the first four summers or five summers of doing camp desperately trying to convert summer campers to our after school program. So you, you know, there's that year round, monthly recurring revenue service. Um, and it turns out, actually, in our market here in Brooklyn, there's just a whole lot of families that only need camp. You know, they're, they're and they and so right away you start looking at you. You know, you've you've made some really good points, Daniel, around talking specifically around the benefits of enrolling in your group piano class and how you linked it to after school, et cetera. I love that you said you could get through this book now and be one book ahead when you started in the fall. You know, so that's that's awesome. Um, but for us, we found a lot of times in our market, it was as simple as like this. They just wanted a really meaningful version of childcare because the parents yeah. were working. And so yeah. we, we just were like, oh, wait, let's be really clear about what they're asking for and give them something really enriching for the week so that the parents can, you know, that they can go through their week having to work in the middle of July and Honestly, do it guilt free because their kids are psyched. I mean, we all know that the best possible marketing you'll ever do is a kid walking out of your program really excited to come back again. Um, so, let me just say one other thing about internal marketing. So, using that e -grow, slowly growing email list of families that have enrolled in camp or expressed interest in camp is that many of your families are going to enroll in multiple weeks. Yes. Many of our families enroll in three or four weeks of summer camp. So when you look at this marketing uh, mountain you need to climb and you think, man, I want to have 150 summer campers. I need to sell to 150 families. It's, it's not accurate. You're actually selling to probably about 70 families to fill that 150 um, camp slots. 
Could I ask a question about that? Yeah, yeah, fire. Because I think this is right in this point of how to promote it. Although it is kind of previewing our next point, which is how to grow it. Is there anything you did to make it easier for those families to say yes? Do you feel like there's anything that you did mm. internally with the marketing? Or was it just yes. that the desire was already there for them? And it's just like, oh, well, I need four weeks of childcare. We love BMF. We're just going to sign up for four. Do you think there's anything you did to stimulate it is basically what I'm asking. There's some simple things you can do where we offer a multi-week discount. It's a 5% off your tuition. Very simple. Just like, hey, you're going to enroll multiple children in multiple weeks. You're going to save you know, a few hundred bucks over the course of the summer mm -hmm. with that 5% discount. Yeah. Um, the second thing is uh, little micro tweaks. Like a lot of times it, they are going to come to camp with friends. Like kind of sort of just like we might have done. And so you can be a little bit more mindful in the enrollment process and be like, do you have friends that you want in your band this week? Um, and so parents feel just so much better if they know that you're also thinking about their kids, you know, social circle and, and the friends that are showing up. So little little tweaks like that um, are, are really beneficial. Uh, but, you know, again, it's 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 really you know, just from a, how are you marketing? And, and then I want to talk about camp fairs for a second before we move on. Yes. Um, but your most important endorsement is the kids. Um, so we do a lot, we spend a lot of time making sure that we're getting quotes from them after each week of camp. What did they like about it? We, most of our marketing material is actually uh, focused on just kids having fun, mm. right? Just happy kids at camp, it could be in the playground, it could be in the band studio. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about curriculum potentially uh, now in or in a future version, uh, future app on our camp. But, but the point is, is that when you're marketing this, um, like at the camp fair, I was just pulling up our working procedure for our camp fair that was written in 2016 or 18 or something, and you know, the, the when we set up our table. It mirrors the experience that we expect someone to have when they come into the community community room at BMF. So our table has hand drums, a guitar. We hand out Brooklyn Music Factory picks. We hand out these little awesome BMF um, sunglasses that we've made, little swag like that. And when kids come to the table, the very first thing we ask is, do you want to write a speed song? Hmm. And the kid's like, what? And so we have a dry erase board and a marker, and they're just we just start writing lyrics in real time there. And the parents are like, what's going on? And five, 10 minutes later, we have like three or four kids at the table and they've written a song and I'm playing guitar or somebody else playing guitar with them. And it mirrors the experience of our camp. And, you know, a differentiator is not having a better buzz reel on a TV set. That's not a differentiator at a camp fair. Mm -hmm. You know, a differentiator isn't having a bigger banner. Like all the camp fair tables have the same access to Vista prints and buying huge banners and blah, blah, blah. The differentiator is you show up to your camp table and you say, this is exactly what it feels like when you're at our camp. Mm. Right mm. now, obviously there are details like you need to make sure that it's super easy for them to fill out, give their name and email, capture their contact information. Those things need to be so stupidly easy for them because there's 40 or 50 of these tables. So we found like, no, we're not giving them a QR code and doing anything fancy. We're literally just, here's a piece of paper. Why don't you write down your name and email and check which weeks of summer camp you're interested in while I write a song with your daughter. Mm. And so really, really like keep it stupidly easy when you're on the ground sharing this. Yes. By the way, we do the exact same thing at our, in our community room on site. At BMF. So when families are coming in, there's a card. They can likely already by January, they'll be able to actually even fill something out and say, I want these weeks. So families that are just walking into BMF are able to do that as well. Mm. So I think those are the only two additions I'd say because you hit really important ones there. Um, we do print, we put up posters, we do all the stuff that feels so old school now, but matters in terms of. It does. Yeah, it matters. Let so. me ask one quick question. You said something I Yo. really liked in there and I resonated with because we also found that families were using the camp 
as an alternative form of daycare. And we would mm-hmm. have both current and new families. And again, we're kind of already leaning into our, our kind of final point, which is how to grow mm. it. Did you ever lean into that marketing angle? Have you, have you, did you, have you ever leaned into that in terms of saying like, Hey, you learn music and it's less expensive than daycare or learn music for the price. Have you ever mm. kind of leaned to that? Obviously that was a little ham fisted in the way that I said yeah. that there. I'm curious. You know what? We're, we haven't used any specific language around pricing okay. and the cost of okay. having childcare, et cetera. But what we have done is we've leaned heavily into early drop off extended day. Yes. Knowing that if I'm going to drop my daughter at work, I mean, drop my daughter at camp on the way to work, the chances of me of getting off the job site by 3.30 to pick her up is like slim to none, you know? Mm-hmm. So we've leaned heavily into that. We've made sure that that was beneficial from a cost perspective. For example, if you want to leave all three kids for extended day, it basically costs the same as one kid, mm-hmm. right? So we make it yeah. really, really simple that way. The other place that we've leaned into um, is we've leaned into two uh, words, both the fun and the safe, like our school, and which is fascinating because I've always been like, why are we so heavy on your kids will be will be safe all day and have fun? And I realized that um, you know, Pira has you know she grew up in a camp. She's been doing this a long time. It's actually one of the most fundamental questions we have as a parent when we leave our kids with the babysitter. Right. We're like, are they going to be safe? Yeah. You know, so that's like the bar is so low there, but that's, that's like we, we, that has to, we have to check that box. So we actually use that. We use that language in our copy Mm. um, pretty consistently from the email marketing to the website, you know, to the landing page. And so that always, I was always like, why? But you know, I'm, I'm like, anyways, I'm not the right person to ask there. Um, because honestly, the people making the choices generally aren't like dad at home deciding yeah. where the kids are going to be, um, you know, right or wrong. That's the reality of it right now. So, right. Um, so anyways, safe and fun are two areas where we have leaned into your, your thought there, mm. thinking that that's okay. beneficial for the parent. We never leaned into that messaging either, the, the pricing, the pricing or piece. the daycare yeah. angle. But parents figured it out on their own, and and they so totally we, do. Yeah. So, but I was curious if you ever did, and I will just say as a final thought, the way I would design a funnel for a summer camp is the same way that I would design a funnel for a private lesson program. If you want to know how that funnel should be designed, just reply to the email you got with this podcast, or go to greatmusicstudio.com, go to the contact form. Uh, we can talk funnel structure. All right, number four, and finally, growing hmm. your camp. Now, before we hit record on this, Nate, you were kind of looking through your historical records, which I love that you have going back over a decade about your camp enrollments and those sorts of things. Mm. And you said that your camp enrollments grew by about 100 each year, and you saw an acceleration in camp enrollments after BMF got a little more organized and started doing annual planning and started doing some things that successful small businesses typically do. I love, I I took point last time on growth, so this time I'm going to have you start. Um, what did you do to grow your camp? Because you started with a couple dozen and then you grew it to 500. What were some of the things that you felt contributed to that growth? I think there's, I'm going to sort of do two 10,000 foot comments on this. Um, The first is we recognize the opportunity. That's number one. Like in our first year of camp, we had 65 enrollments. It was probably many of those were the same kid doing multiple weeks. So I don't know how many actual kids we had. But right. 65, and it generated like $44,000. And that was in 2011 or 2012. And once we started seeing like 30% growth year over year in the first couple few years, we were like, wait a minute, there's an actual need here. So it's like just the classic recognize that there's a need in your community and recognize that you're at least hitting some of the points that the that your demographic is desiring around features and benefits. And you're like, oh, this could be good. So number one, Just know that there's an opportunity there for you. Even if you're not clear on what to offer, you're like, I don't know if I want to offer a group um, lesson class or I want to offer a songwriting class or I want to offer an ensemble 
you know, a, a, a workshop or whatever it is, first recognize there's an opportunity. The second is, is once you recognize that there's an opportunity, which we did, I'd say around, I'd say we realized that it was going to be essential to the financial health of our business by, I think by 2014 or 15. So three or four years into it, we were like, wait a minute, we should treat this actually as a cornerstone of our annual budget. Hmm. Once you do that, that's when you begin to allocate resources. That's number two. By resources, it's what you were talking about, Daniel. Like You have to actually say, I'm going to commit time to it in October to map out your calendar so that you can hit these benchmarks of marketing and sales so that you have a successful summer camp. You have to actually allocate time in January, February, and March to the hiring of staff that's going to be seasonal um, et cetera. There's all these different steps that have to go in that, that you're going to start doing. And, but step number one is this is important. We're going to allocate some of our, of our creative time. We're going to allocate some of our dollars. So to be clear, like I'm sure we didn't get full return on all of our marketing investment in the first few years. Hmm. We were just like, let's get out there and start testing out, you know, a camp fair. It's a perfect example. I described what our camp fair is like. I promise you our camp fair table wasn't like that in the first couple of years. Yeah. You know, it took us a few years of testing it out. So that's, that's, you know, you're investing your resources into the long-term growth of it. Um, so those are the two 10,000 foot, recognize the opportunity and then allocate resources. And you asked, you, you know, you made the comment that when we really exploded in summer camp was after those two things came into place. And then we really, inv I mean, like, to be clear, when we were doing annual planning, I was saying, you know, we reached a point where 30 percent or more of our annual budget was gross revenue came from gross camp. Revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, so then once we invest, once we decided that that was going to be you know, 30% is a big chunk. So when you're like, that's going to be how we fund this small business, you know, an X percent of net is going to profit is going to come from that. Once you establish and, and say, I'm committed to this, then all of a sudden you as a founder um, uh, approach it entirely differently from a creative standpoint, from a planning standpoint, from a team building standpoint, right? And that's one of those things that was so pivotal pivotal for me at BMF was when I res was when I, I you know my partner Pierre and I looked at each other and we're like wait this is we will sort one hundred percent put our time and talent and treasure behind this. Mm -hmm. Um and so that happened and ever since then it's been a refinement of um how to make it consistently profitable, easier to sell, etc. I love that. The recognition Greg and I had that moment as well, but in a different mm. way. And I want to maybe just detail that because it kind of goes to, I think one of the big takeaways that people can leave this episode with. When we saw how successful we were in enrolling people who'd been through the camp into year round lessons after that, we, after a couple summers of that, and then as the camp grew, because we had a lot more enrollees second summer than we did the first summer. Yeah. When we saw that, we began to look at the camp in a different way as, oh, wow, this is, a, this is actually an enrollment drive for the fall. That's what this camp is. Mm -hmm. And so we started actually putting a lot more budget into marketing that camp because we knew it was going to fund. Uh, we knew that what we were actually doing was not funding. We were filling up enrollment for the school in the fall because of the camp. That was kind of the eyes that we had. We had the eyes to see that opportunity. It was a different opportunity that we saw. It was a different thing that we saw, but we had that kind of same realization moment. Oh, this is actually much bigger than just, oh, here's a, <laughs> we started with an inauspicious real, um, motive. Uh, we don't make enough money in the summer. What can we do? Oh, a summer camp. That was the yes, motivation. Totally. Yeah. Five years later, it was a lot more sophisticated. Well, um, you said. Wanna... Go ahead. Well, can I just? You said before when we were talking about it, you were like, 
we had enrollment from summer to fall as high as 70% um, into your, you know, into your um, monthly after school program. And that's amazing. You know, BMF has never had 70% enrollment from camp into after school. Um, and I talked about that a little bit before. But the way I frame that, your comment, your realization with Greg, Daniel, is that you just saw that actually this was m- this. Of course, it served a revenue need. Of course, mm-hmm. it served a budgetary need. Um, it needs to do that. But you were also like, oh, this also tamps down our marketing costs. Mm-hmm. We no longer have to invest the same amount into mar- into that Google Ads funnel for after school as long as we treat our summer fi- camp families um, in a different way. Yeah. We can actually save money over here by by investing more money into delivering on a, a you know a more robust camp experience and i'll say that what you're talking about there what i'm talking about there is really the number one growth advice and takeaway that i want to leave people with but before we get to that you i want to ping it back to you Nate because you talked about two 10,000 foot things that helped you grow the, your program to much bigger than we ever did is there mm. anything else before we close out that you want to say like contributed to the growth and maybe you kind of weave that into the takeaways as well, however you want to do it. But I'd let either practical things or other things that you felt contributed to you growing from 68 to 500. I would say, um, uh, this is sort of a, it's, this is a deeper answer in terms of trying to figure out precisely what we did differently, but once the camp started to get legs, like you were describing, you and Greg saw enrollment increase year over summer over summer, and you're like, wait, we should spend more time on this. Um, one of the things that we did was we started investing in like a camp manager. We invested into, and we're going to talk about this in a future episode, but we started investing in the people that were delivering on promise for camp. And what that ended up doing was really improving the in-camp experience. And so at the, you know, it it ended with things like an amazing camp, you know, we're a songwriting camp. So by the end of the week of camp, all of the bands are performing original songs and they're performing original songs on our maze stage. And what we did is we started investing in people to make sure that that final show on Friday at four, which had like 100, 150 people in the room, Most of them parents thinking it's Friday afternoon. I'm just going to pick my kid up. Boy, I'm beat from a week of work. I want to just like, you know, have a summer weekend. Instead, they stepped into this incredible show. And we started investing in making sure that that camp experience was like really had a wow factor. It was like it was 5x, 10x better than what a parent thought it could be. So they thought, man, my kid's happy. I'm getting child care. I know Brooklyn Music Factory is a, a, a trusted resource in our community. I'm going to send my kid there. Then they'd come in Friday and they'd leave by five o'clock singing original lyrics that their kid and other kids had written. And they're just like, wait, this is so much more than what I thought it was. And we would literally have parents asking on Friday, and this is an important piece of this from a marketing and sales stand. We had parents asking, "Can is there any way my child can get into next week's camp? And we, you know, it's very normal for us to have a waiting list that's 150 to 200 long for our summer camp. And that last piece is the why, I think, behind it is that the the teams has just done such a good job of trying to improve on what it is that we're doing within summer camp specifically, within that experience. Um, So that's a, that's a, that's like a, that's like a great little growth. It's not a growth hack. Because a hack is sort of feels like you just sort of a quick fix. It's not at all that. It's a summer over summer, year over year, saying like we're gonna we're gonna improve these few things for the kids' experience so that parents are walk away um, and the word of mouth is like so potent on the street where they're just like this is the camp. My kid just cannot get enough of this. Um, so there's that, and 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 in terms of big takeaways, Daniel, let me let me share one. And then ping it back to you. You know, my role in camp has not been on the ground, right? My role in camp has been to help with budgeting, to help with the hiring process where I can, 
to help with the curriculum development throughout the year where I can, working with the teams there. And it's primarily in the marketing piece too, right? How can I benefit the camp team um, from both a budgetary standpoint, you know, sort of CFO and also marketing um, and some sales. And so the real big takeaway for me observing camp from that vantage point was that, man, this has such a huge potential to influence other aspects of our business. So I'll give you a couple of real examples. Like one of the things that my partner Pira asked for was like a much simpler version of budgeting for this camp. And this camp would gross, you know, could gross anywhere between, you know, it started grossing $44,000, $45,000 a year. And, uh, you know, it'll, I don't know what it'll gross this year, but it'll be somewhere in the three hundred dollars to $400,000 range, right? She's like, I just need a really simple budget that I can plug in and tweak so that I can add things like, hey, I want to I want to buy pizza for everyone on Fridays. I want to order T-shirts. I want to do these little things. How can I just do those? And 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 one of the ways that things like camp really helped me from a CFO standpoint was just realizing, man, it's so valuable, and I can create very simple templates for someone like Pira so that she and her team can run camp autonomously from a budgeting standpoint. And so you might be listening and going like, well, how's that really valuable to me? I only have like 100, 150 students in my school and I don't really have to worry about budgeting that much. And But that's because you just have yet to see these other revenue opportunities maybe. So when we were talking about recognizing the opportunity, like Camp Daniel became this thing where I was like, man, I need to look at the entire business, the private lesson, channel, the group class channel that's after school, the summer camp, the birthday parties. I need to look at each one of these services and products we sell like I do camp so that it's just, it's operating in this very simple and predictable and profitable fashion um, for for the company year over year. So one of the big takeaways for me was just being like, wow, you know, and you you touched on this when you and Greg were talking about it. It's not as basic as just a way to make money over summer. Over the summer, it just isn't that basic. If you view it that way, it's always going to be an afterthought. But once you shift into the mindset of wait, this is going to have a profound influence on the over the whole year of what we do, whether it's a, an enrollment opportunity like you were saying from summer into your fall group piano class, or it's um, just re- vastly improving your word of mouth for new families to come in, or it's something like leaning. We lean heavily on it from a budgetary standpoint. We know that this revenue is going to come in now through things like early bird sales and pre-sale of camp, and that's going to give us cash flow through the spring. That's going to benefit us as we look forward. So there's a lot of ways that it can benefit your small business. Don't think this should surprise me. Mm. And we didn't talk about what our takeaways are going to be before we hit record on this episode. Mm. And what I don't think should surprise me is that our my takeaway is almost identical to yours. Mm. What do you got? Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to labor on on the same points you made. I'll just say this. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to one of my favorite quotes. I've probably said it a half dozen times over the last couple of months. It's my favorite quote from Naval Ravikant. You're doing sales because you failed at marketing and you're doing marketing because you failed at product. Mm. The reason why you grew 30% a year, the reason why we had rapid growth from year to year is we had so many parents who came back the next year and enrolled yep. their kid again. And we had opportunities for them. In fact, even... We, what ended up making the piano, what even brought the piano express curriculum to existence is we had so many parents who out of the blue, we never mailed them back. We never emailed them. They reached out to us and said, Hey, are you doing another camp this year? They're already much better, but we want to do that again. So we wrote an, ex- we wrote another curriculum for kids. Who, yes. Um. So it was not us forcing it 
it was based on demand and the demand was there because the kids had a great time. The demand was there because the parents respected what we did. The demand was there because parents trusted us. They did feel safe leaving their kids there and driving off to work. The product was really, really good. And it generated demand in and of itself. And even down to like stories that you told, they kind of mirrored the stories that I was going to tell. We built a performance into the Friday afternoon so that parents could see what their kids had been doing during the week. And so we had parents come in for a mini a mini recital. The fifth day the child has ever played the piano and they're having their first recital. We made a video, which we sold to people. Parents bought that video. It wasn't a big revenue generator. I mean, in fact, we probably lost money on it if you take into account our time. Totally. But parents bought it because they were so proud of what their kid did. And we literally had parents after like walking out. I remember this to this day. This was like 17 years ago. Saying like, I can't believe that they can do this. Now, yes. listen, they weren't playing Rachmaninoff. They weren't playing, you know, a really hard solo from like an Elton John or Billy Joel song. But the parent just could not believe how much energy the ho- child had. And that's why we called it Piano Express. It was like a rocket blast. It gave kids not only hmm. a leap forward, a fast start, a quick start to their, you know, you know acquiring this piano skill. It, it also was like a rocket launch of energy that that child had that impacted them for years to come. And we know because so many of them enrolled in the after school program after that, and we could track their progress and see how well they did and how the longevity that they had in the skill. And all that came from us having a really good core idea and did just playing games with the kids, designing the day in such a way we weren't doing anything super special. The curriculum and method that we wrote for that first week it feels like we were heavily influenced by the Fabers. We weren't Mm -hmm. at that time doing anything super unique like what we're doing now with grouplessons.com and the Piano Express curriculum now. It was a fairly standard just beginning method that that we wrote. But we had to write it because of how we were dividing the day up to keep the kids energized and that sort of thing. So product is the central aspect, to I think, of making this grow because you want parents asking when it's going to happen again. We would even have, and I remember this too, we had parents who brought their kid for the second year and we see their four-year-old tagging along with them and we'd make a comment like, oh, I can't wait till they're, you know, a couple more years and then come to the summer camp. And the parent said, I can't wait until they can do it. I remember a parent saying that. I can't wait until we can enroll them in this camp. That was for our big kind of commercial studio camp. Even for my own personal camps, um, I just have like one little addendum that I want to put onto that. That was something where it was more of an extension of my multi-level groups that I was running. It wasn't much different than what the kids were getting. And the way that I quote unquote sold parents into it was I just said, Hey, I know you people often take the summer off. If you want to do that, that's totally fine. I don't want them to lose momentum and roll them for one week of the camp. And they'll actually get, they'll probably, pass more music that one week than if they were enrolled all summer long. And so the parents started doing it. And what I did was make sure that there was a difference in the mind of the child as to what they were doing in the camp. Even though the core curriculum was the same as my multi-level groups, Mm -hmm. I put games in it. I put prizes in it. We had super bucks that they could earn for passing songs. The kids would literally beg their parents. And so I started doing them during summer break, fall break, winter break, spring break. Yes. Um, and the, and literally, I would just mention to the kids that there was going to be a book blast camp, which is what I called them. And the mm. kids would go home and ask the parents to do it. And I would just sell them out months in advance. I didn't have enough time to do them, especially during like the fall, Christmas, and spring breaks. I did during the summer. I could sell out almost the entire summer's worth doing one or two of these camps a day with five kids only. Five kids only. Um, right. But it made my summers the most profitable time of the year because the kids would beg their parents to come to it. And all I had to do was just be, was just make sure that the music felt easy, make sure that they were having a good time and give parents uh, uh, um, enough advance notice that they could kind of plan their summer around that. And as a final thing, I would just say that not only would the parents then enroll the kids in the book class camp, some of the parents would enroll their kids in the book class camp and then go ahead and take lessons the entire summer too. So, mm. yeah, you, you know, Anyway, just some just some growth. I think just that's my one growth strategy and takeaway is that if you make the product really good, 
it will sell itself. And then it's just a matter of clearly delineating the value and what they're gonna get out of it and how much fun the kids are gonna have and just being super, super clear about it, letting people know in advance and, and uh, just giving plenty of opportunity, making that enrollment process really, really easy. That I think is not only my number one growth hack, it is also my biggest takeaway that I would have people take away from this episode.